Dr. Mickey Brock is an associate professor of history at Washington and Lee University in Lexington, Virginia, where she teaches the histories of early modern Europe, the supernatural, and poverty. Her research focuses on religious beliefs and identities in early modern Scotland, including demonology and witchcraft, the British reformations in Scotland in the popular imagination. Dr. Brock completed her PhD at the University of Texas at Austin in 2012. Her first book, Satan and the Scots, The Devil in Post-Reformation Scotland, circa 1560 to 1700, was published in 2016 as part of the St. Andrew's Studies of Reformation History series. In this book, Dr. Brock argues that ref Reformed Protestant belief in Satan's presence in everyday life played a significant role in shaping the experiences, identities, and shared culture of the Scottish people. She concludes, quote, the belief in a ubiquitous earthly devil, one who infiltrated and even resided in the hearts of men and women, indelibly shaped how Scots of all sorts perceived their communities and themselves. Dr. Brock also co-edited the collected edition, Knowing Demons, Knowing Spirits in the Early Modern Period, which explores the theory and practice of knowing demons and spirits, including angels and fairies in the early modern era. It explores the formation, practice, and performance of Protestant identity, amid these interlocking crises of the 17th century, and it discusses how piety was fashioned through individual and collective responses to extraordinary challenges like pestilence and conquest, as well as more predictable problems like sin and encounter with strangers. She's also published several chapters and articles relating to the themes of the Scottish Reformation, including women in church discipline, the relationship between ministers and the laity in their parishes, and spiritual responses of covenanters to Cromwellian invasion of Scotland. Her forthcoming monograph is titled Plagues of the Heart, Crisis and Covenanting in a 17th Century Scottish Town, and will be published by the Manchester University Press. This book takes a microhistorical look at the southwestern port of Ayr as a case study for understanding how Scottish Protestants responded to the tumultuous period between the British Civil Wars and the Revolution of 1688. Dr. Brock is also in the process of co-editing The Rutledge History of the Devil in Western Tradition. Dr. Brock is also the co-director, along with Dr. Chris Langley, of an ongoing digital humanities project funded by the National Endowment of the Humanities and the Strathmartin Trust. This project, titled Mapping the Scottish Reformation, is actively developing a digital database and mapping tool to trace the careers and relationships of early modern Scottish clergy from 1560 to 1689. She is also an avid runner and is the mother of a dog named Fergus and a cat named Merle. And the title of her presentation today is That Horrid and Devilish Sin, Witchcraft in Memory in Covenant in Scotland. Thank you so much to Grant for that very generous introduction. Um, although I sort of claim the cat is mine. Uh, <laughs> speaking of demonic. <laughs> um, but thank you to all of the organizing committee uh, for, for inviting me. This has been a really tremendously fantastic and exciting morning. I've heard some really wonderful papers and can't wait for the rest of the day. Um, I know it's after lunch. I know it's quite warm in here, so I'm going to do my level best to keep everybody with me over the next 45 minutes or so, and I will endeavor to keep to time. Um, so as Grant mentioned, I've just completed a book that uses the Royal Borough and Port City of Ayr, which is located in the southwestern part of Scotland. Um, if I can close it, Jamie. Sorry, I think you have to resume it, maybe. All right, let's see if that does it. Voila, okay, here we go in the southwestern part of Scotland as a case study in the way that Protestant self-fashioning operated at the local level. Now, you may be wondering why is this random American interested in air? Um, and actually, when I first started this project, I would tell people I'm writing a book about air, and they're like, well, that's a large topic. It's all around us. <laughs> um, but I became interested in it because really it's a, a place that's seen as at the heart of Scotland's radical covenanter country during the 17th century. Um, and it had the same minister for nearly 45 years, a man called William Adair, who you see located there on the left. And as I was writing this book, uh, my mind kept turning back to the dozens of local women who were accused of witchcraft and in some cases executed for that crime during his tenure as minister. 
Um, in some ways, I say I tried to write a book about covenanters, but the devil always brings me back. Clearly. Um, and that has been the case here. Um, and I'm especially interested in what the cases of these women in air can tell us about the major Scottish witch hunts at the end of the 1640s, and also a much lesser studied witch hunt in 1658 and 1659. Um, and the stories of these women are really at the heart of this talk today. I'm going to begin in August of 1650 with an entry in the Kirk Session records, that is the records of the local ecclesiastical court in air. Now to orient ourselves and time and space, there are a couple of things that I would like us to note. Um, I know a lot of y'all will be familiar with this, but for those of you who are not, we are talking about the height of Covenanter country and the height of Covenanter power in Scotland. Um, as a refresher, the term Covenanter refers to those who swore the national covenant that was composed in 1638, um, an ambitious but profoundly consequential document that was written in response to the rebellion against Charles I, it, written as a response and a rebellion, um, when Charles I tried to impose the Book of Common Prayer on the Scottish Kirk the previous year. The Solemn League and Covenant, composed in concert with English parliamentarians in, and sworn in 1643, further committed the Scots in body and spirit to pursuit of the true faith, which was widely interpreted in Charles, Charles II's, no, sorry, Charles I's Northern Kingdom to mean a Presbyterianism. Um, and I should say one of the things that's really important about these covenants and the rituals in which they were sworn is that this was a profoundly communal activity, right? They were read to the congregation from the pulpit and everybody was encouraged to hold up their hand and swore to uphold these documents committing themselves to further reformation and pursuit of the true faith. So a profoundly public ritual. And I've argued in my forthcoming book that it is participation in this ritual and its ongoing requirements that led to the creation of a culture of covenanting in the 17th century. Now, in the summer of 1650, where we will begin, it had been about 18 months since Charles I lost his head. Uh, which you can see pictured here, <laughs> in case you're wondering who that, that was. Now, the Scots were no fans, for the most part, of the Stuart King, but on the whole, they were appalled by the regicide, and they responded promptly by declaring his son to be King Charles II. Fighting between the forces of Oliver Cromwell and the Scots soon ensued, adding yet another chapter to the previous decade in which the three kingdoms had been at war. By this point, too, the Covenanters, the most radical of them, controlled the reins of church and state in Scotland. Um, they had been in power largely since 1638, but their levels of control and their zeal had really accelerated. And you can really point 1648, 1649, 1650 as the apex of their power, though it would be short-lived for those of you who know the history. Um, and I've also argued in my book, and we'll say a little bit in this talk, about the degree to which the influence of these covenanters persists well beyond the beginnings of the Cromwellian occupation in 1651, and even through the restoration in 1660. And places like the Southwest really remain covenanting heartlands. So on this day, it's actually August 28th, for those of you who want precision, in 1650, the very busy Kirk session worked through a backlog of cases that had languished while William Adair, the longtime loan minister of the parish, had been, quote, absent at the army for the previous three weeks. Made up of the minister and lay elders chosen from the parish, the Kirk session was tasked with, among other things, policing any immoral behavior in the community. And they found a lot of it, as those of you who've read the records will know. Towards the bottom of the docket of this day on August 28th, following the usual fare of blasphemy and drunkenness and some light fornication, was the, <laughs> was the case of Janet Campbell, who was accused of, quote, the sin of filthiness with one Andrew Carr, who had been an English soldier stationed in the town. Campbell, who at the time of her appearance was pregnant, confessed to the charge, but clarified that while the said Andrew had a carnal deal with her, it had only happened once. Uh, she wanted to make quite clear that she was not one of those thrice fornicatrixes running around at the time. 
The session asked her where Carr was, and she said he had died in a nearby village upon the Thursday after the first witches were burnt. These are Campbell's words, upon the Thursday after the first witches were burnt. Campbell's own sin of fornication had changed the course of her life by making her a mother. The sin of witchcraft, an intense outbreak of which was sweeping Scotland, informed her sense of time. And I'm actually really interested in these moments when people say this happened X number of days after some witches were burned. We see a couple of examples of that in air. Two weeks later, two weeks after this case, the session reflecting on the many concurrent, quote, calamities of the land set apart the coming Sabbath for a day of fasting and solemn humiliation. Witchcraft, war, invasion, fornication, and more for the generation of Scottish Protestants who witnessed the tumultuous period of the British Civil Wars, the Cromwellian occupation, the turmoil of the Restoration, and more, there was little doubt that God was angry and the gains of the Reformation were at stake. And in these years, alongside dramatic moments of crisis, civic and spiritual leaders grappled with long-standing concerns of the Kirk, things like Sabbath-breaking, sexual impropriety, other sorts of sins that pre preoccupied the Kirk for reasons both pragmatic and providential. As one preacher put it, whatever his parishioners did in life, they must, quote, be zealous, for there were abundant snares without and corruptions within, seeking to lead them astray from the godly path and bring ruin on their communities. Few of these snares, I would suggest, were as existential to the Scottish Covenanters as the sin of witchcraft. As early as 1640, the General Assembly, the leading ecclesiastical body of the now Covenanter-dominated Kirk, commenced regular lobbying of Parliament for increased action against witchcraft. Such efforts were not in vain, for the number of known accusations for witchcraft reached sub subsequent peaks during the hunts of 1649 to 50, 1658 to 9, and of course the great Scottish witch hunt so-called in 1661-62. 1649 in particular, so the year before this moment that we are beginning with, saw not only new legislation, but according to Christina Larner, perhaps the greatest number of executions in the history of Scottish witch hunting. As John Young and Paula Hughes have shown, this enthusiasm for witch hunting ought to be understood as part of the broader program of moral reform implemented by a hardline covenanting regime seeking to create a godly state. Little wonder for the act of becoming a witch was an explicit and dangerous betrayal of the Scots covenants with God, both national and personal. Indeed, I actually think one of the most notable aspects of the cases of witchcraft during this period in the covenanting era is a real rise in the mention in the records of accused witches having explicitly covenanted with the devil in some way, as opposed to just describing that relationship as a more than mere semantics, this shift in the typical language of the demonic pact reveals, I think, the reconceptualizing of all sins as threats to the covenants, as well as heightens even apocalyptic anxiety about the actions of the devil, there he is again, seeking to impede the aims of the covenanted Kirk and state. I really feel like I should have that church lady meme on here, the kind of <laughs> Satan. Um, but I, I didn't know what sort of crowd this was, so I didn't want to throw that up there. <laughs> but I should have done it now that I'm here. Um, so this afternoon, I'm going to offer what are fairly admittedly preliminary thoughts about two questions, which have yet to be fully addressed in the robust extant literature on the witch hunts and on covenanting. And that is to what extent did the covenanters reimagine the project of witch hunting? And what can witch hunting tell us about the relationship between faith, gender, and power in covenanted Scotland? More implicitly, I'll, I'll think about how it's a ground up local approach as opposed to extant work on witch hunting in the covenanting period, which is very top down, might offer new and important ways to get to grips with the lived experience of witch hunting in the period. And what I will argue today uh, in brief is two, two things. First, that the intensity of witch hunting in covenanted Scotland 
epitomizes the key aims and gendered nature of the covenanting project itself. It was not a sideshow, it was central. And I will also make the case that, witch hunts, that witchcraft's comparative absence in the stories we so often tell about covenanted Scotland reflects the gendered nature of Scottish historiography and historical memory. So this talk, there are lots of things that I could have focused on in this talk, but I'm going to tell you the stories of three women all called Janet. Um, again, for those of you familiar with Scottish records, there are a lot of Janets, um, but I've picked three of them that I think really represent what I want to talk about. And all three of these Janets live in air. So I'm drawing this material. I'm using air as my own case study for the point I want to make today. So well before the covenanting era, we meet our very first Janet. Her name was Janet Smalley. And in 1613, she appeared before the Kirk session of air for the sin of uttering, quote, filthy, slanderous speeches towards her neighbors. What she said, we don't know. But if similar cases are any indication, she might have accused a man of being a thief or his wife of being an adulteress, or perhaps even worse, she said something sexually explicit or took the Lord's name in vain, or maybe even both. Whatever she said, it was serious. For her punishment, she was hauled before the town's fish cross, the stone marker at the center of Ayr's bustling fish market, where a small spiked instrument was placed into her mouth. Known in Scots as the Branks and elsewhere as the Scold's Brittle, it was intended to silence and humiliate her. For she had apparently been a long time blasphemer and a general thorn in the side of the Kirk. Her case did not end there. In 1621, the Kirk Session minutes tell how Smalley had repeatedly been imprisoned for, quote, numerous misbehaviors to sundry persons. In 1630, she appeared before the local criminal court for the open profession, profession and practices of witchcraft and sorcery, which is an accusation altogether unsurprising for a woman with Smalley's sordid reputation. Her punishment differed in this case from the typical strangulation followed by burning. Instead, she was dragged and flogged through the town and burned on the cheek as a mark of her crime. And, and this is the only instance of, of branding that I found in some of these cases. I'll have to ask Brenna and others if, if you've heard of others beyond this. She was banished along with her branding and told never to come back to the town for, quote, all the days of her lifetime. And if she did, it would have been on pain of death. Well, our first Janet was not one to follow the rules uh, and return she did. And we find her again in the records in May of 1650, an old woman languishing in jail. And there she died and found no dignity in death. Minister Adair ordered that Smalley's corpse after her death in jail be carried on a sled to the gallows and burnt in ashes as a belated execution for her devilish crime. Now, when I first read about this, I was puzzled. Why would William Adair take the course of posthumously executing Janet's body? Doing so, mind you, was not a cost-neutral endeavor. Borough account books make for a cold and gruesome read when you stumble across entries like the 1595 register of the death of Mary in grief in which it explains the costs of the coals, cords, tar barrels, and other materials that burned her body. But the fires were already lit in 1650. Scotland was in the midst of a nationwide hunt that peaked between the summer of 1649 and the autumn of 1650, raging until the Cromwellian occupation at the start of the next decade redirected the ecclesiastical establishment's attention. We ought to view this peak in witch hunting, as Paula Hughes has put it, as the culmination of, quote, 10 years of political and religious, the 10 years of dominance of political and religious life by Presbyterian radicals with apocalyptic visions and an impending sense that the nation's troubles resulted from the scourge of the ungodly, threatening to subvert a covenanted and godly nation. Uh, this particular batch of Presbyterians was not especially chill. Um, which is a, an understatement, I, I think. Witches, as we shall see, and disorderly women more generally, could not, by the regime, be countenanced. Amid this national witch panic, 
In the spring of 1650, the members of the Air Presbytery, the regional ecclesiastical body, had met to take into consideration, quote, with great grief of heart, that horrible and exorable sin of witchcraft at this time so much abounding in the land. Every minister in the area of the presbytery was exhorted to be, quote, faithful and careful in searching out witches in their own parishes and bringing them to justice. And here you see an excerpt uh, from the presbytery record where everybody is being warned to use diligence for witches. A week later, neighboring Irvin Presbytery, quote, finding that the sin of witchcraft was growing daily in its own parishes, requested that the Parliamentary Committee of Estates grant a commission to try the said evildoers. Usually, such a request to have a commission to try witches would have gone to the Privy Council. But during the 1640s, the institution was greatly diminished and largely supplanted in its duties by the committee a governing body greatly influenced, if not outright controlled, by the wishes of radical covenanters. The General Assembly, the governing body of the Church of Scotland, also took an increasingly large role in the hunting of witches during these years, working with Parliament to empower the localities to root out what they considered the most egregious sins. By early May of 1650, the intensity of the situation had grown apparent to central authorities. On the first day of the month, the Air Presbytery received record of the confessions of five women, four of them residents of Air Parish, for, quote, that horrid and devilish sin of sorcery. There's my title. You always got to search the quotes for the best title. They moved quickly, the Presbytery moved quickly to obtain a commission, again, for the trial and punishment of these women. And by early June, the Borough Jail held several accused witches and was busy making room for more to come. As the number of the accused grew, the Kirk session agreed to appoint daily an elder and a deacon to, quote, oversee the prisoners as they awaited trial in order to, quote, exhort them to confession and to pray to God with them. Long days and nights awaited the session, not to mention the accused who no doubt experienced the torture of sleep deprivation during this period. Appointed members by the session were meant to watch over the purported witches in 24 hour shifts and quote, to take all pains for the furtherance of so good a work. And here's actually, I should say as a side note where the local dimension is really interesting to me. These elders knew these women. These deacons knew these women and they were being told to stand and watch over them in 24 hour shifts. And and I I want to imagine sort of the interpersonal dynamics and the feelings of betrayal that were undoubtedly experienced by the women who were in jail and and perhaps some of the conflicts even that the elders may themselves had. But regardless, I'm also interested in this idea of confession, right? Why were they exhorted to stand over these witches and ask for their confession? not least because some of them had actually confessed before. So what does this mean? I think we ought to see this desire for confession not as just a means to conviction, but also part of a broader emphasis in post-Reformation Scotland on the importance of confession for communal purity and social cohesion. As I've noted, some of those awaiting trial and heirs jail, they had already confessed to the town provost and the local magistrates. What the elder and minister sought then was not so much a confession of crime, but a sincere acknowledgement of sin. And their goal was a common one that will be familiar to anyone here who has studied this period. They wanted to keep the wrath of God at bay and the imagined godly community intact. Though we do not have records of what happened to these local women being asked to repent during the witch hunts of 1650, it is likely that many of them received the common fate of strangulation at the stake, followed by the burning of their corpses. The hunts continued into the following year, and it is here that we meet our second Janet. In the summer of 1651, Janet Sawyer was arrested for witchcraft and jailed. And I'm probably pronouncing her last name poorly, but I keep trying to say Sayer or Sawyer, and I'm getting it wrong. So we're going with Sawyer, like Tom Sawyer, because it's easier for me, (laughs) so that's what we're doing. The the charges against Janet Sawyer are exemplary, both of general trends in Scottish witch hunting and also the mid-century mood, which was not a happy one. 
Many allegations against her centered on old communal rivalries and grievances. She had been seen, for example, with her arms around the neck of a horse that belonged to a neighbor who she had often quarreled with. Within 20 days, the horse, that's him here, <laughs> had died. Um, the neighbor, John McConnell, did not fare much better, growing so feverish and faint that, quote, he was altogether weak and unable for working and sometimes knew not where he was. And harm to horses is actually a really um, particular theme of her case. She was also purportedly a threat to local families and even more gallingly innocent children. In the late spring of 1649, for example, when Sawyer was arguing with a neighbor couple, she had grabbed their baby from its mother's breast and shaken it in anger. Not good. <laughs> The startled mother had cried out, Lord, save my child, avoid thee, Satan, down the stair with you, witch thief. And Sawyer fled, calling behind her many injurious words, as the record puts it, as she ran away. Um, the family, who she had quarreled with, soon experienced extended tragedies involving injured children, a miscarriage, and impoverishment. Now, other charges of harmful magic are more unusual in Janet Sawyer's case and they speak specifically to Eyre's seaside location. She had, support, supposedly, raised a ship, ra raised a storm to destroy a ship that was stopping at Eyre en route to Barbados. Um, again, here's the, here's the ship, um, an, an approximation of, of the ship. Um, <laughs> just take some illustrations here. It's hard to find illustrations when you're dealing with Calvinists. Do you know what I mean? So you, have to, you, have to, you have to be creative, I think, here. Um, the evidence for this raising of a storm was that she had been seen floating in the ocean near the shore, sucking on the air like an udder. A witness also reported that she had predicted, quote, hard news for the husband of a neighbor which indeed came true when he had been taken captive by a pirate for a year. Her reputation for the devilish art was thus clearly well established, and it was further confirmed when another local woman, also named, who was a confessing witch, named Sawyer as one of the members of her crew. But perhaps most damning, at a time when the clerical leadership of Eyre was increasingly emphatic about purity and compliance, Sawyer challenged the authority of the Kirk in a very direct way. Some years back, she had reportedly cursed an elder who found her absent from church on a Sunday and threatened to report her to the session for discipline. Very ordinary thing in this time period. But the following Monday, he fell ill and just before his death declared that Sawyer was, quote, a devil out of hell. She had also quarreled with William Smith, the church reader, over rent payments, despite warnings from others that, quote, she should not meddle with a man of the Kirk, she peppered him with malicious words near her home. Shortly after this, when Smith was on a visit to see Miss Minister William Adair, he passed by the same spot where Sawyer had cursed him, and, quote, a great pack of wool fell directly on his head and, quote, dang him to the ground. For Smith met his maker soon after. So things did not bode well for Sawyer, as you might imagine, who checked all the typical boxes of harming neighbors, children, animals, the economy, and the Kirk itself. And what's more, and this is always something really to keep in mind when you study the witch trials of the period, is that people genuinely seemed to fear her. And little wonder, because from Ayers' pulpit that previous summer, William Adair had told his parishioners that, quote, witchcrafts are a cause of God's fiercest wrath. Soon a commission was granted for the trial of Sawyer and a number of other accused women, and their fates looked very grim indeed. If a 1652 report on local witchcraft cases from William Clark, an English statesman in Scotland, is any indication, horrific torture, including things like whipping, burning with candles, and time on the strapado potentially awaited them. Yet none of these women who were accused alongside Sawyer would have their day in court or their days at the hands of the executioner for another seven years. And that's because a new and profound sign of God's displeasure 
one that provided a sort of even greater logistical challenge than witchcraft had occurred and captured the full attention of the town's covenant or leadership. And of course, this was the Cromwellian occupation, um, started by an invasion um, of Cromwell's massive forces, which would occupy the town of Ayr and much of the country of Scotland from 1652 to through the remainder, remainder of the decade. So our two Janets, we have one more to go. Our two Janets, reveal much about the continuity of much older dynamics of witch hunting. Things like initial charges of Maleficium, the power of reputation, and the local to central court progression of the cases which had been staples of Scottish witch hunting since the 16th century. But their stories, I think, also reify the degree to which witch hunting had become enmeshed in the broader covenanting campaign against sin. After all, the act passed against witchcraft by the Scottish Parliament in the early months of 1649 at the urging of the Covenanters sat alongside other provisions targeting adultery, fornication, blasphemy, incest, and more. In these years, the hardline Covenanters who held the reins of church and state at virtually all levels went through a sort of systematic, had they gone through a systematic process of purging moderates. So really we are at the apex of Covenanting power. And this led to increasingly developed networks of communication and like-minded zeal between parishes and presbyteries who were dominated by ministers jointly committing to the godly project in its most extreme forms. And the upshot of all this is that during the covenanting period, the hunting of witches becomes not only more urgent in the wake of the chaos of the civil wars and the eve of the Cromwellian occupation, but also more streamlined and efficient. The covenanting revolution in government, which people like Laura Stewart and David Stevenson and others have written so cogently about, was perhaps no more evident than in the administration of witch hunting. At the same time, however, the turmoil that followed the regicide and the divisions within the covenanting movement also made their campaign um, more vulnerable to derailment, which is frankly precisely what happened on the eve of the Cromwellian invasion and with the disastrous Scottish losses at Dunbar and Worcester, um, and then the ensuing invasion of Scotland in 1651. So we need to figure out what the fate of our second Janet was. We don't know yet. Uh, we've, had a, we've had an occupation, a sort of interim, an extended intermission that nobody wanted, I think. Although, except maybe Janet. Um, <laughs> but we need to move ahead in time to the waning years of the Cromwellian occupation, five months before the death of the Lord Protector. Early in 1658, Janet Sawyer is again in the Kirk Session records, which I should add are extant for this entire period. Air is remarkable. They're unbroken for the 17th century, which, you know, historians love that. Um, the handwriting is not, I wouldn't say that was unbroken, but the rest of it is quite, is quite good. But we find her in early 1658 in jail, awaiting trial for her devilish crimes that had been committed purportedly before Cromwell's men had invaded the town. It had been lucky, albeit only temporarily for Sawyer, that 17th century English judges were significantly more reticent than their Scottish counterparts to prosecute witches, and even more skeptical, skeptical about the uses um, and efficacy of torture. And indeed, actually, between 1653 and 1657, English commissioners in Scotland kept witchcraft to um, really a comparative minimum, um, only about a dozen um, women met their, their, their deaths in this period, which I actually think is really interesting given that when the Puritans are in charge in England, um, it's the 1640s that's a period of real sort of chaos. Um, I think we can think about the ways in which sort of Sco anti-Scottish prejudice is bleeding into this, but um, for the matters of time, I won't give you a feel about my thoughts on this. Um, I also think it's, it's really quite interesting that it's in 1661 and into 1662 that Scotland witnessed its largest and most intense hunt at a period when Scottish authorities, with their legal power now renewed, began violently to seek out long neglected witches. And there was also, I think, we, that we should pay attention. I also think we should pay attention to the fact that there's a very large uptick in the number of persecutions of witches in Scotland um, at the very end of the Cromwellian period, beginning in late spring of 1658. And I'm still thinking about why English authorities kind of took their, 
their foot off the sort of neck of the judicial system in Scotland in this moment. But regardless, it's clear that by the end of the Cromwellian period, Scottish leaders felt more empowered to address what one influential minister described as, quote, much witchery up and down our land. Now, this, this period of the witch hunts in 58-59 is wildly understudied, I think, but it's best understood in two ways, as the release of a safety valve opened as the legislative grip held by English authorities was loosened, and as a dramatic expression of the intense desire to regain control of a religious and social situation that had deteriorated over the past years under occupation. In air, this meant that the numbers of women who were accused early in the decade found their time very much up. Um, Janet Sawyer first went to trial of these out of these witches who were sort of awaiting um, their, their trial from those initial 1650 allegations. Um, I won't go into the details about all the things that she was accused of. Um, on top of those forced situations and other things that I've mentioned before, but when she was tried, when her court was tried at the High Court of Justiciary in 1658, we see very typical demonic charges enter this story. The renunciation of her baptism as part of the pact with Satan, receiving the mark of demonic servitude. And she was, of course, one of those women who were victims of the witch prickers who were very active in Scotland in this period at the end of the 1650s and into the early 1660s, searching out parts of women's bodies and occasionally men, but usually women. Uh, for the devil's mark. The end of our second Janet's ordeal is vividly written about in an account mm -hmm. by Colonel Sowry, um, who was an English officer in air, Robert Sowry. And he wrote about this story, um, and we have it in, in one of uh, the collections of letters and documents from in the first book from the period of the Cromwellian occupation, um, in which he writes that Sawyer, did constantly deny that she knew anything of witchcraft. And as I was informed by those that heard her, when the minister, Minister Adair, was urging her to confess, she had these words, quote, Sir, I am shortly to appear before the judge of all the earth, and a lie may damn my soul to hell. I am clear of witchcraft for which I am presently to suffer. And Sowry goes on, Colonel Sowry goes on to observe that the people in this country, meaning Scotland, are more set against witchcraft than any other wickedness. Now, it's likely that the colonel's words were influenced with a very robust sense of cultural superiority and a general distaste for Scottish customs. But there is little doubt to, to there is little doubt about the general veracity of his account of Sawyer's last days and the zeal of Scottish witch hunters during this kind of last gasp of covenanting power. Okay. So it had been a challenging period uh, for, for the Scots and Air and throughout the country. And it was one that only reified the commitment of ministers like William Adair to creating and maintaining a covenanted kingdom. Witches who had egregiously violated their covenants with God and with country would not be tolerated. Um, and there are lots of cases from um, 1658, 1659 in the, in the records, the Court of Judiciary records, now held in Edinburgh, that look like this, basically detailing all of those many crimes of these women. And I, I really do think these cases have been understudied because they're so, so dominated in the literature by the great Scottish witch hunt of 61 and 62. But anyhow, we have to leave that, we have to leave that, leave that aside and meet, I think, our final Janet. I think it's time for her. And then we're going to talk about memory for like a hot second. <laughs> So our third Janet, actually, the reason I want to talk about her is not because she was formally tried for witchcraft. She was not. But her case, which shows up in the Kirk Session records, represents the degree to which witchcraft was understood both by elites and by ordinary men and women as not operating within a silo. It was not separate from the lived experiences of having the Kirk Session seek out discipline of more quotidian sins. Really, after more than a decade of attempts by local leaders to frame all sins as violations of the covenant, witchcraft was seen as part and parcel of a larger morass of wrongdoing. And, and our third Janet, Janet White's case, is an example of that. So we're skipping ahead slightly to 1650. Well, I guess we're going back to 1653. Um, 
And this was a moment in which there was a lengthy, so this is about two years after Janet Sawyer's case had started. This is a year after the beginnings of the Cromwellian occupation. And in this year, Ayers Minister and Elders conducted a lengthy investigation into a conflict between two women, Janet White and Helen Brackenrigg. And they were, these were local residents, local women, who had used the language of witchcraft to slander each other. Um, and this is something that's not unique to air. I've just written an article uh, or a chapter that will be coming out later this year, I think, about sort of slander and witchcraft and the use of these witch calling cases, as I'm calling them. But anyhow, um, these women had been involved in witch calling cases. Brackenrig, in particular, had claimed that Janet White had called her a witch and spread a rumor that she had, quote, witched White and her husband. Worse still, White had told others that Brackenrig ha had, quote, born a bairn to an unknown father and then buried the babe in the yard, adding an allegation of infanticide on top of witchcraft. When the session called White, our third Janet, to explain her words, she confessed that she had called Helen a witch, but insisted that she too had been wronged. She reported that, quote, daily and hourly I am molested with the scandalous speeches of Helen Brackenrig, who not once, not twice, but every time calls me a witch. What is more, Brackenrig Helen had accused Janet White of, quote, lying with the Englishman, plural. It's an unsurprising allegation at a time when the exasperated Kirk session had taken to punishing local women in batches for sex with Cromwellian soldiers. So widespread was the problem. Now, there's more to this case, um, including the gruesome discovery of what was deemed an untimely birth in Helen Brackenrig's yard. But for our purposes, what is noteworthy is how the respective testimonies, which began with rash allegations of witchcraft, quickly became an amalgam of the Kirk's gendered concerns during these chaotic years. I think our three Janets reveal, among other things, how at the height of dogmatic Presbyterian power, the covenanting agenda had a discernible impact on the lives of Scots of all sorts but it affected women in specific and complicated ways. On the one hand, um, as I've written in a, a chapter forthcoming for a Festra volume for Elizabeth, edited by Catherine among others, um, this covenanting agenda offered women additional means of resolving the domestic and neighborly disputes that greatly shaped their experiences. Through swearing the covenants, they had also been given an explicit stake in what Laura Stewart has called the, quote, remaking, remaking of the political order. On the other hand, however, they could only collaborate with the arbiters, arbitrators of institutional power within a system that was fundamentally patriarchal. Moreover, they could be targeted by the revitalized disciplinary program of the Covenanters in ways determined not only by their gender, but other forms of social hierarchy. These trends only accelerated in the 1650s, when towns like Ayr housed hundreds of strange men in town with the English army and saw a massive upsurge in sexual scandals. And as a result, parish kirks viewed female bodies as the primary sites of and potential vectors for social and religious disorder. This policing of women's actions and bodies was by no means a new development, but rather a longstanding feature of a disciplinary system that was heightened by the anxiety and unpredictability of the years surrounding the civil wars and the subsequent Cromwellian invasion. Indeed, in a sermon delivered in summer of 1651, at the height of all this, William Adair made clear the Kirk's made clear that the Kirk's perennial fornication problem was bound up with the sin of witchcraft. When he told his parishioners that, quote, whoredoms and witchcraft go commonly together. He went on to explain that witchcraft is a fruit of the flesh and the sin of horna, whoredom prevailing is an introduction to all others. In other words, sexual crimes were a gateway to even graver offenses like witchcraft. And at the core of both, we find a pronounced anxiety about unbridled sexuality, especially among women. The drive to er eradicate witchcraft then should not be seen as an aberration from an otherwise discipl gender blind disciplinary program, but rather 
as part of a, co a core part of a gendered search for order among disorder um, in covenanted Scotland. And here I'm actually critiquing arguments that have suggested that the Scottish program of discipline was gender blind. I think that's rubbish actually, but, but it's, okay if you, if it's okay if you don't think that, but that's why I, I don't agree with that. Um, for, for a whole, I feel like I should stop in that language. I don't agree with that. Um, <laughs> so to conclude, I'm gonna say a couple of things about how memory factors in here. Um, I've been thinking about memory a lot. Uh, I taught a class on the Salem witch hunts last semester in which my students did a really lovely project where they designed a Salem memorial. There are lots of Salem memorials, but I asked them to sort of think about the ways in which we encounter history in the built environment and to propose something. And this got me thinking about the memorials of the Covenanters that litter Scotland, especially in places like the Southwest that, main, that remained Covenanting mainstays, often in rejection of royal authority well into the 1680s. Most of these memorials, and this is just a, the Memorial Association, they are celebratory or rooted in rather hagiographical descriptions of martyrs in the so-called killing times of the 1680s, which of course was a favorite subject of authors, Presbyterian authors in the 19th and early 20th century. And the story of Scotland's covenanting ministers turned martyrs has long dominated the popular understanding of the 17th century to the extent that people think about the 17th century at all. Um, but basically, as I find it, people have Mary Queen of Scots, maybe some covenanters, but usually just skip from Mary to the Jacobites. I, I find that tends to be the norm as people think about it. Um, Liz, Liz Ann Henderson has actually argued that it is probably due to the fascination displayed by Presbyterian hagiography for such legendary persecution that the subject of witch hunting in the southwestern counties has largely been ignored. Um, and I think here about the works that were written on William Adair that I've been drawn from for my current book. Um, the, the then minister of the Presbyterian or the, the parish of Air in 1932, a man called Archibald McKenzie didn't say anything in his entire book about William Adair's tenure about witchcraft, except for one line in which he wrote that Adair was associated with ecclesiastical and civil authorities of the time in their measures for the repression of witchcraft. What a horrible use of passive voice. If this is one of my students' essays, by the way, what he was associated with. Um, you know, I even in uh, another example of this, there's a, a book by Murray Lyon called Air in the Olden Times, written in 1928. And these, these accounts are tremendously useful. I'm not knocking them, but rather pointing out the ways in which they sideline or ignore the witchcraft project. And he wrote in this book that the only evidence of witchcraft in the parish of Air had happened under the tenure of a man called William Anon, who he hastened to add was an Episcopalian. Right. Um, now, this is not true. Right. But he wanted to sort of say that. So even in, and I should say even in the mass of really great scholarship written about the Covenanters today, I'm often struck by the ways in which the witch hunts are almost framed as a mere side project, a, a straightforward continuation of older practices. Now, the latter is true, of course. But even if the tune was old, the Covenanters wrote new lyrics and they sang loudly indeed. They took it to 11, to use a reference that only some people who have seen Final Tap will get. Um, so I wanted to set this to conclude against the backdrop of recent campaigns to try and get greater recognition in Scotland of the experiences of Scotland's accused witches, um, accused women of witchcraft, um, be it through a formal apology, a pardon, public memorials are just greater awareness. Um, public scholarship, many of y'all will know, things like uh, the Survey of Scottish Witchcraft, which has been now turned into a fantastic map that is actually currently, they're editing it to add sites of memorials as well. These things have really brought witchcraft into the public memory. Public scholarship has been central to this. And of course, most people in here will know that two years ago, almost to the date, on International Women's Day in 2022, Nicola Sturgeon, the former first minister of Scotland, issued a formal apology on the part of the Scottish government um, for the execution of roughly 2,500 people, about 85% of them women, for the crime of witchcraft. And scholars have debated the efficacy of that apology, but nonetheless, it represents a change. 
and how people are thinking about this moment in history. So last year, and I promise I'm concluding, <laughs> last year I was contacted by a group of local women in air who were working with the artist and scholar Caroline Sutton to create a memorial to the witches from their community. And this memorial was part of Sutton's broader project called Witches in Word, Not Deed. And I think I have a, a picture of this, um, Witches in Word, Not Deed. And the project, I was contacted by them because they had found the cases of some of Ayer's women, um, but they were struggling with the paleography. So they asked me to transcribe these cases, and I did. Um, and what they did was take the experiences of these women and the words said by these women during their cases and the words used against them and created um, these dresses, these embodied forms that humanized and reified that these were real women who had this happen to them. And these women, when I talked to them, they said that they felt that this was almost a tricky thing to do in the region where they live, in, in Scotland's southwestern Covenanter country, where the Covenanters are really remembered as almost crusaders for Scottish independence against royal imposition. But they wanted to say that there was more to that story and there were impacts of the Covenanting project that were felt profoundly by Scotland's women. I, as an American, was able to be like, okay, I'm going to participate in this and be enthusiastic about it and to have a, a sort of different perspective. So um, I think this work is really beautiful. It was um, displayed, this is another image of the dresses displayed at night as part of the Tam O'Shanter Festival, the a Robert Burns Festival in the Southwestern part of Scotland. Um, and I think they're really phenomenal. And I spoke to Caroline Sutton a couple of months ago, we had a Zoom call. This is the artist behind this work who worked with these local women and others to create 13 dresses in total. Um, that embody, embody the experiences of these women. And I asked why she felt this was important, especially in our current moment. And she told me she wanted to remember Scotland's witches in a dignified way to represent their loss of life in a physical form. And she wanted to humanize them as real ordinary women. For as she put it, quote, once the accusations against them came forward, nobody saw anything else. So in conclusion, I will just observe that while the Covenanters may have orchestrated some of Scotland's largest and most violent witch hunts, when it comes to the popular memory of the 17th century, the accused witches may yet have the last word. Thank you so much, Dr. Sure. Brock. That was an excellent talk. We have about five to 10 minutes for questions if anyone in the audience wants to ask any questions. Yeah, the harm to animals, livestock, the things that are at the core of ordinary Scots economic ability to get through harsh winters or ordinary weeks or, or things that are just staples of their economic lives are often centered, uh, often centered in some of these initial charges about witchcraft. Most of the allegations of witchcraft begin as these harmful magic charges and, and animals, livestock are often featured. Um, the milk of cows being spoiled is often features that reoccurs in a lot of these. So it's, it's very actually typical of the sort of domestic charge. What's more in, unusual are the very sort of seafaring specific charges, which tend to happen in coastal communities, as you might imagine. Um, and also, I think the explicit nature of the threat she posed to the Kirk, that's in some ways the most interesting to me, that she had very explicitly challenged the reader, for example, and an elder. But that's not singular. That happens elsewhere as well. So, yeah, it's a great question. Um, I'm just curious, like, what is the, the norm for, like, let's say, if you're reading the records and you're talking about a man who maybe yelled at his neighbor and something like that, like, is he accused of witchcraft? Is it not even reported? Like, how is it so gendered? Uh, yeah, so are you asking the why 85% women or about their records themselves? I guess in general. Yeah. Like, there's a, 
they are only having the assumption of the effect on the women suffering sports and disease. Yeah. Okay. This is a great question. So I don't want to say that it's exclusively when women do these things, but it is 85%, right, in terms of looking at the total numbers. And that is because, and this is something um, Sierra Dye has worked on really brilliantly, women's words were believed to be particularly powerful because women lack the physical, political, economic, social power of men. So the sense was they were most likely to use their words, often words that were imbued with a magical power because of the deal they had made with the devil to harm others. And I think this story is tremendously rooted in interpretations of what happens in Genesis 3 and the sort of reinterpretation of that story as featuring the serpent of Satan, um, sort of luring Eve away. Women's words were not to be trusted. They could be more dangerous. And I also think people really saw in this period women's words as profoundly connected to expressions of disorder and unbridled passions in those things. For men, there was also a much broader scope of acceptable speech mm -hmm. and the boundaries with which women could operate were much more narrow, especially in the expression of negative emotions. That's something I've been thinking about a lot. Actually, it's not only it's coded that way, but what is the appropriate emotional range for women? And how does that look different than the ways in which masculine emotions are bounded in the period? And words are often the expression of that. So it's, a, it's a great question. I, I don't know if I answered it, but no, okay. okay. Yeah, please go. Go here and then up there. Uh, you basically answered my question, but something I noticed is all three of these women, they came across as very difficult people mm. to work with or to live around. They're always just causing trouble mm -hmm. and getting into conflict with people. Mm -hmm. um, and, I found it, and I found that very striking. Not mm -hmm. as this being a community regulation thing, mm -hmm. but almost as a last resort. I mean, well, not that that's an interpretation. Yeah. That's a, I mean, that's, that's a great question. The question often is actually, how does one fight with your neighbor where you mutter some things at them? How does that turn into a witch hunt? And why are some of those cases actually just slandered? where the person who was, was slandered counter to who says, I'm not a witch, in fact, you need to pay me damages. And so it's an interesting question of how did court sessions and neighbors determine, right, which of those to take seriously as allegations of witchcraft and which not. And that is where things like reputation come into play in a profound way. That's where things like just the sheer timing, right, the way, the power that words were imbued with and the fear that they could provoke was really heightened in the Covenanter era. Um, so I think things snowballed more quickly. Um, it's, I think it's quite telling, actually, that Jan the first Janet, her case starts in 1613, but she's kind of allowed to go on, and it's only with the real sort of intensification of covenant and control that you see Janet Sawyer's case sort of move quite quickly, right? Because I think of that, that sort of intensity and just, again, the machinery of government moving, moving quickly. But it's a it's actually a really great question. And it's one I've thought a lot about myself is like, what makes one woman's words scary and another woman's word not? And the other thing I'll add is something that Julian Medeir has said um, in some of his work, which is once a woman was a soul, once a woman was labeled and really determined to be a loose woman, once she was seen as someone who's dabbling in things she shouldn't dabble in, that's all she was. And men were able to transgress and return, and transgress and return. There was rare scope for that. For women, it was more narrow in these moments, in particular, of this fear of disorder, right? And I really think the covenanting period is like everything's going to hell in a handbasket. We got the king, we got some wars, we got Cromwell doing what he's doing. People are worried. Well, for a while they liked Cromwell, but like let's set that aside. But I think it's like, <laughs> and there's a sense of how do we impose order? And women's words become the target. Right? That's a I rambled on about that, but I have feelings about it. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, I have a, sort of a. Where do you see a lot of the research now going with topics like this? Because at the moment, especially with the uh, relation to memorialization, because um, with Nicholas Sturgeon's policy and yeah. also the issue of like how do we should we be commemorating this yeah. and questions of like how do we do it properly. Yeah, I, I love that question um, because it's not an easy one. Um, and I, I actually just think that I feel this question quite, quite profoundly because I'm on a campus where Robert E. Lee is buried and there's a big debate about the name. And I, I mean, I, I genuinely live in the American South. You think about the ways in which history is memorialized all the time. And I think about that even as like a white lady, you know, and, and I can't imagine what that's like for my colleagues and colleagues. The reason I say that is I think, I see when a lot of people talk about this slippage 
between history, memory, and memorialization. And those are not the same things. Right? History is what we all do. Memory is what we all, the stories we tell ourselves, the things we do remember and spread and share in those traditions. And memory can be central to the creating of history, but not always. And then memorialization is about how we choose to engage with the past in our built environment and in our common discourse. And I think for me, the scholarship is going in the direction, or I hope it goes in the direction, that really is thoughtful about those things not being exactly coterminous. They, they, they're different, they serve different functions. Um, so I, you know, I will say with regard to the debate over whether or not it was appropriate for like Sturgeon to give an apology and whether or not in some ways, in fact, that diminishes the real fear that people really had of witches during the time or applies sort of modern standards to past ones. I think the real policy ought to be one of harm reduction. And I think ultimately it's more, it reduces harm more to create a memorial and to recognize the suffering of these women than it does to sort of parse the nuances of whether or not this gets the history perfectly right. Right? I think we should be governed as scholars in the world by a policy of, of both sort of truth of our sources but also harm reduction in the implementation of that as well. So I think, particularly with regard to memorialization. So I don't know if that answers your question. No, it does. Yes. <laughs> it does. It does. It does. It does. When I think about it, so. It does, it's a really good answer. Okay. When you talk about the second bit there, I'm yeah. sorry, I couldn't help but think of Monty Python, that scene with uh, the trial of the witch and Holy Grail. Yes. I just couldn't get that out. I always yeah. show that to my students. <laughs> No Monty Python anymore. I mean, it's, you know, <laughs> I know, I know, you know, they use. Um, <laughs> um, I think that is unfortunately all the time we have for questions so we can get everyone to the next panel in a timely fashion. If we could thank uh, Dr. Hopkins. <laughs> And she will be around the rest of the day if there are people who want to ask questions. Fantastic. Fantastic.